absolutely fine. So, um, so I guess uh, I just did a bit of a, uh, an introduction and I, um, a couple of people have asked um, if I just do it again. So, so if you don't mind, I'll just talk, I've just got a bit of your background here, Deb. So, um, so Deb graduated um, as a chiropractor from South Africa and worked as a chiropractor in the UK with her husband, who's also a chiropractor. Um, she then applied for medical school um, and during medical school, she had two children. Um, I'd like to talk a little bit about how she actually survived that. Um, and then she had a third child while doing her internship. So she was accepted for a, a very competitive orthopedic surgical registrar training post. And after five years was accepted um, and got a fellowship of the Royal College of Surgeons of England in trauma and orthopedics. So her special, chosen specialty is spinal surgery. Um, she's got a lot of uh, studies that have been published that you can look up. And she also wrote a book, which looks really interesting called The Dragon Slayers Club, which is an anthology um, with female surgeons from around the world, sharing their stories to encourage uh, girls to, to come into STEM careers. So, um, so obviously you're an overachiever and you do much more than, than most people. So, and thank you so much for taking the time to, to get here, Deb. We really all appreciate it. It's great. No worries. Thank, thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. It's always, I, I love talking to, to people and particularly chiropractors. Chiropractic remains very close to my heart. So, um, you know, very passionate about helping out the profession and staying involved. Um, and I, I think that goes back to as I was, you know, as we're struggling with some of these technical difficulties, you know, hearing those questions about relationships with other medical professionals and how to build those. And, you know, I, I think that's a struggle for everyone. So um, I wasn't entirely sure where you wanted to start. Well, I think I think it was probably a good idea to start with um, sort of acute, acute stuff. So acute lower back pain or acute neck pain. You know, after a trauma, and you know, what should we look for? You know, if there's, um, you know, if there's concerns around, you know, do they have a CF leak or, or those types of things? I know you've got a lot of experience with trauma, and um, yeah. go through that. Okay, so um, essentially, the, the the basic rule is you have to take a really good history and do a thorough examination. Um, and that's something I drill into everyone, regardless of their profession and regardless of, of how senior they are. So without those two pieces of really important information, it doesn't matter what the imaging looks like. You really can't make a good decision. So the imaging for me comes a lot further down the line because often I get contacted by people and they say, well, can you have a look at this imaging and what's your opinion? Yeah. And then the first thing I say is, well, can you tell me the history? Can you tell me examination findings? And that always catches a lot of people short yeah. um, because for some reason they're not expecting that question. Even though you think that is really a basic question, a lot of people just think, you know, you make all your decisions based off the imaging, which is really not the case. So um, everyone who comes in has a particular personality. Every injury has a particular personality. And then imaging kind of, either confirms or denies that personality, but really the imaging should just confirm what you're already thinking. So um, if someone comes in and they say that they've had a significant injury, you know, something like a fall from standing height, um, you know, someone's pulled a chair out from under them, they've knocked themselves at work, they've walked into something, banged their head, is very different to someone having a big car accident, being dumped yeah. in the surf by a wave. Um, so you've really got to take into account the nature of the injury that they've had. If they then come in and have a, you know, a, a very significant injury and they've got pain out of proportion from what you would expect from just some muscle spasm, then straight away you should be on alert that there's something going on that needs most probably a bit more investigation before you make any decisions about what to do with the person. Um, and generally at that point, you're starting to ask about the initial injury. Were they able to walk immediately? Did they get out of the car themselves? Did they have any pain straight away? Um, you know, if they were stuck in the car, needed extraction by ambulance and never walked until their friend dragged them into your office, you know, that's a very different scenario to, 
this accident happened three weeks ago and I've been walking and doing all my usual activities, but I've still got pain. Yeah. So you've got to kind of put it into that kind of context. Um, anyone who's got neurological deficit of, of some sort, and that could be altered sensation to actual weakness, altered reflexes and power deficits, um, has to be seen in the context of what their baseline was. So one of the important questions is if they come in and, and you do an exam and you notice that you, know, you don't have a, a perfectly normal exam, you then have to ask the question, what were you like before the accident? Have you always had good strength there or was this something that is, you know, has been pivotal following whatever injury? Um, and then you've got to examine the person in terms of pathological reflexes. So it's really easy when someone walks up holding their neck and says, doc, I'm really worried my neck is too sore. I don't want to let go because I feel like my head's going to fall off my shoulders. Yeah. Um, that person turns around immediately and goes to the ED. Um, that is a very classic sign for an unstable neck. If they come in and say, oh, yeah, you know, it's just a bit sore over here, mm -hmm. um, then that's a very different personality and person. So you, yeah. you have to see that in context. So it would be the personality of the injury. You've also got to look at the person themselves. So if there are a big, robust, um, you know, young sporting person yeah. and they've had a fall from standing height, you're far less worried about that than if you've got a frail old lady who's, you know, in her 80s that's been brought in by her daughter um, and she's fallen out of her chair and she's got ongoing neck pain because she's most probably got osteoporosis. She's got lots of other things going on, mm. is most probably not as tolerant of that injury as someone else. So you would have a lower threshold for sort of seeking assistance with her before you did anything. Um, but realistically, the, the main big thing for me is the presence of central spinal pain. So a lot of people will have muscle spasm that affects the paravertebral muscle spasms. They might be a little bit sore in the front. Um, but if someone is pinpoint tender, over a spinous process, midline tenderness, then that for me mandates imaging straight away. Yeah. Um, and what Im whatever imaging you've got really depends on what you have available. So if an x-ray is the only thing you have available, then that would be a good starting point. Yeah. Um, if you have access to anything else, certainly in hospital, we have the luxury of the person coming in and going straight through the CT scanner. Yeah. We don't even get an x-ray a lot of the time. So um, those are the big ones for me. So that's central both for cervical and for lumbar? Throughout, throughout the spine. Okay. So, um, you know, the, the first thing I do, history, good examination. Um, and then what you don't want to do is you don't want to do a passive range of motion. You want the person to actively move, you know, do whatever movement they have. Yep. And the reason for that is that if you passively move the joints, if you've got an unstable joint that you move passively, you've got a much higher chance of creating an injury versus if they actively move it. Because if they've got a subluxation um, or a fractured dislocation, heaven forbid, they will be restricted in what they can do or they will actively say, I'm too painful to do it. I don't want to do it. So what you don't do then is then get hold of them and passively range the movement. Everything about clearing the cervical spine is about what they can do actively and how much control they have um, over, their, over their neck. Because if their neck muscles aren't engaging or their core isn't engaging, if they've got a lumbar spine injury, that immediately is, is an area of concern for us in terms of saying, is there something more serious going on that I'm not seeing at the moment? So if you have someone come in who is typically antalgic, you know, and they, they're saying, you know, I, I just... I cannot move or I, I just woke up like this. Um, so initially you get them to try and move their head. If there's no movement there, what, what are the next things that you do? So you're looking at palpating to see if there's central tenderness and then looking at yeah. the reflexes. So I, I normally go through the look, feel, move um, yep. protocol. So the first thing you do, um, again, history examination, have they had an accident, something, you know, they rolled their car the day before, then went to bed and then couldn't move the neck in the morning. Um, a bit different to, I've been working at my desk all day and then went to bed, woke up. So, you know, you, you need to kind of get the personality of what you're dealing with. Mm -hmm. um, 
We then start off looking at the person, look to see what their sagittal alignment is, look at their coronal alignment, look at the position of the head, the comfortable position of the head. Do they have a rotary uh, positional deficit? Do they have an inclination? Do they have a torticollis? Um, you're looking to see is there any noticeable muscle spasm? So is the sternocleidomastoid really bunched on one side or the other side? Do they have any bruising, particularly if they've had trauma? Are there any skin changes that make you think there might be something else going on? Um, and sometimes you can pick up other things. So certainly within the hospital, people come in with a big black eye or they've got a split lip or whatever. And what they've not told you is someone's punched them and they've had a hyperextension injury. So, yeah. you know, you have that, that low threshold for really being a bit of a detective in terms of really teasing out what the crux of that source yeah. was, what was the culprit. Um, if you've got something relatively benign, like they were sitting at their desk um, and, um, you know, they, they didn't really have much of an issue going on and they'd just woken up because they've slept in a strange position, I'm far more comfortable proceeding onto a passive range of movement in that case because I'm relatively sure that the chances of a fracture dislocation, um, you know, are minimal. Yeah. Um, if you've got someone who's had a high-speed car accident, obviously you know that that's more of an issue so sorry have have you got a big message banner across the front of my nice. video that's all fine i've just i've just had someone send send me a text so matthew on my screen is currently wearing a headband um of a text message but i'm just wondering if everyone else can see that see that banner okay so <laughs> so so it, it's all about you know just having that thought process having that logical that logical train of thought. Um, so the big thing is active range of movement is very telling in terms of what you're currently dealing with. But passive range of movement is good, provided you're not worried about a significant underlying injury. So something like, you know, um, irritated facet joints, um, some facet blocking, an exacerbation of facet arthropathy, all of those, you know, do very well with movement um, passive range of movement, um, but possibly not doing so well on the active side. Okay. Someone who's had a high speed injury, you're going to be reluctant to do the passive side of things until you've got a lot more reassurance that there's no mischief there that you've, that you can't see. Right. So we, as someone who doesn't really have access to a CT, you know, readily, um, yeah. how do we, how do we proceed with that? I mean, obviously if they're, totally antalgic, um, yeah. how, can we, how can we really determine with what we have, you know, what the extent of the injury is without obviously making the problem worse? Yeah. So if a person has walked into your practice, um, yeah. chances of making anything worse is again, perishingly small. Um, okay. And that's because they have demonstrated by the mere fact that they're up and able to walk. Yeah. that they have that we, we talk about this as a trial of life so the fact that they've been up they've done a certain number of activities and have managed to get to your practice um, indicates that there's a an element of stability there that's reassuring um, okay. I, I might not put them down and side posture them straight away but i have an element of reassurance that you know this person isn't going to turn into a paraplegic in front of my eyes yeah. so you know, that's one concern that you can just lay to rest at that stage. Um, that's very different to a car crash happening outside your office um, and someone lying on the ground and saying, I can't get up, I can't walk, my back's too painful because that again, you know, those are all really concerning features. So I wouldn't get someone up in that situation. I wouldn't say, right, mate, on your feet, let's see what you can do because there is a chance of injury there. Okay. Um, so if they've had a reasonable trial of life and, you know, a trial of activities, then that's, you know, that's reassuring. Then you could do some plain film x-rays. It's always good to do the x-rays erect or weight bearing. So if it's the neck, you want to do an AP lateral open mouth, um, which is a, a standard trauma view. If you're looking at lumbar spine, then you're looking at an AP and a, and a lateral there's no information to be gained from an oblique, either on the cervical spine um, or the lumbar spine that you can't gain for an AP or lateral, unless you're doing that specifically because of the technique that you use. Okay. Um, 
And what you're looking for on those x-rays is on the cervical spine. Um, generally, what you're looking for is the anterior vertebral body line, the posterior vertebral body line, and you're wanting to make sure that your spinous processes all follow an anatomical line yep. at the back. Um, from the front, you're wanting to make sure that your spinous processes all line up, that you don't have a big rotary deficit on either side. Mm -hmm. um, and on the open mouth, you want to check that your lateral pillars are congruent with the level below and that you've got no fracture at the base of the peg. So those are very quick little things that you can look at that can be reassuring. If something doesn't look quite right, you want to focus in on the facet joints because you want to make sure that you've not jumped a facet. And sometimes people can jump a single facet or they can jump both facets. And we've actually had people come in to clinic who've got facet dislocations, who have actually tolerated that injury very, very well, um, have had an incredibly painful neck but haven't sought help for a number of a number of weeks. Wow. So that is the one thing that, you know, on a plain x-ray, you get that double shadow mm -hmm. on the facets. It's one of those that can be quite subtle. Um, and I think if you haven't seen it, if mm -hmm. you are taking your own x-rays, it would be good to maybe try and look up a few of those images and just familiarize yourself with what that looks like. Because when you see it, it's one of those that you think, oh, yeah, absolutely. It's like looking at the nose on someone's face. Yeah. But if you've not seen it before, it's actually quite easily missed. So these people can't move at all or do they have some range? They do have some range. And part of that is the mechanics of the neck. So yeah. um, your, the majority of your rotatory movement actually comes from your dance and your peg. Yep. So unless you've got a very high cervical spine injury, you can actually have a reasonably good movement that may not be picked up on examination that there's a, there's a deficit. Sometimes they say, look, I can move really well one way, but I have difficulty going the other way. Um, mm -hmm. Or they're not aware of the difference, but doing the examination, you say, look, I can achieve, you know, 70, 80 degrees rotation to one side, but I'm only hitting 30 degrees on the other side. So there's something going on. So this is where, you know, the history of the exam is very important because then you do start to wonder, is there, um, you know, is there a facet pathology? It, it's unusual to have it, but yeah. they are there and, and they do come along. So you just have to be thinking about that as a possibility. So what about if you have someone who's had, say, some sort of lower back trauma and they, you see that they have, you know, a, a grade two spondylolisthesis, like how, how do you take into account whether that's a recent traumatic thing or whether that's something that's been underlying and it's now causing issues? Yeah, so a, a lot of this is, is sort of difficult decision-making, particularly if this is the first time you've seen the person or the person doesn't have any previous imaging for you to compare to. Yeah. So if you do that uh, and you, you say you, you've examined the patient, Let's say, for instance, this person's actually had a car accident and they've come to you now because they saw. Um, what you actually are looking for there is, one, can you see any evidence of sclerosis on the end plates? Because that would be an indication this is a long-standing injury. You've also got to then look at the reason for that lysthesis. So is there an acute fracture? Because that is different or is there or is there a pars defect which is most probably long-standing um, if you have a pars defect and you think i'm not sure if this is acute or chronic then you go to the patient two fingers poke him in the back the person goes ow um, you you're then thinking right there's an acute element to this i'm not sure if it's the pars element that's acute or whether i've just got acute muscle spasm because they've irritated that long-standing lysthesis and they've now got reactive muscle spasm um, and really then to make that differential you are looking at more advanced imaging um, but you know that's really a lot of the time that you've got a pars defect it's, it's actually chronic and you can see that sclerosis and you're looking for those well-rounded edges you're looking for signs of um, sometimes you get a little heterotopic ossification around the area you can see changes around the actual foramina coming yeah. out um, or if the pars is intact they may just have a um, the two other options are they've got really long pedicles, so congenitally long pedicles, which gives you that impression, 
or they could have a degenerative spondylolisthesis where the pars is actually intact, but you've just got excessive movement at mm. that area. So the other thing to remember is that, you know, you don't have to make a diagnosis immediately at that first appointment, particularly if the person's had problems for a number of days or a number of weeks. There's nothing wrong with saying, right, we've got this, let's give it a couple of days and catch up with you in two or three days and see how you're traveling. And if they're still very sore or you've thought about things, you've gone back, you've examined them a second time, um, that you're still worried, you can then make a decision about whether you think this is more of a long-standing issue or whether this is more acute. Um, and, you know, it, it's not an easy decision-making process. So anyone who thinks it is, it's not. And I think this is one of the reasons we wrangle with it so much. Um, but it's very easy to see these changes on CT, which is where we have the luxury of being able to say, you guys say, look, I've seen this person, I'm worried. They then come to ED because they're really sore, they've had an accident. We, we put them through the CT scan and we say, oh yeah, they've got a PARS defect that looks you know, it's long standing, off you go, we'll see you in clinic. Um, it, it's just, you know, a lot of people worry that if, if they do that, if they send the person through ED, either someone's going to point the finger at them and sort of say their clinical skills are wanting, um, yeah. or they're going to have their confidence undermined and that the patient will be told not to come back to them or, you know, not, don't see chiropractors because they're dangerous. Um, and, and that is just, you know, a real lack of education on, on, the other, on the other side of the fence. Yeah, I can understand that. There's someone who did say, when you mentioned about a facet slippage, like what, yeah. what was the procedure for, for rectifying that? So the first thing is, um, is it uni, is it a, a single-sided facet jump or is it a bilateral facet jump? And how is this impeding the person's life? So what we would normally do at that stage is once we'd identified that there was a facet dislocation, you'd want to know, is it a fracture dislocation or is it just a dislocation? Because they're two very different injuries. Yep. If you've got a fracture dislocation, they've essentially decompressed that area because that facet is mobile. So even though the superior facet is sitting anterior, by having that fracture, it means that they're still mobile through that area, which means there's less of a risk for a cord injury. But if they've jumped that facet and the facet's intact, you've then got a high pressure system on that area with a risk of a cord injury. And if they've jumped both facets, you've got a real risk of canal stenosis, a traumatic canal stenosis. So the first thing we do is once we, once we see that, again, we get a CT scan to just delineate whether there's an associated fracture or not look at the bony anatomy in more detail and then we generally get an MRI scan and that is to look to see if there's any cord changes, to look to see how much um, CSF is surrounding that cord, how much wiggle room we've got in there and if there's any risk of stenosis in that area. Now if we, if the person's a number of weeks down you know from this injury and we know that there's a, a dislocation or a fracture dislocation there and there's no concerning features on the MRI and they've got quite a lot of space, we don't actually have to do anything provided they're comfortable. We counsel them that, you know, they're likely to have arthritis. And if they've jumped both facets, then we would normally do surgery to try and, and reduce that. If they've jumped one facet, they can normally tolerate that quite well. If they've got a fracture dislocation, then we make a decision about how much of that facet has been taken off in terms of the fracture. And if it's more than 50%, then we would normally look at stabilizing that area surgically. If it's less than 50%, often we just manage it non-operatively in a collar for a period of time. Um, but if we're concerned about canal injury, if they've jumped both facets, then we would normally want to reduce that. So if we have an acute injury, so say the person's been involved in an accident that night, they come to ED the same day, um, we normally have a fairly high success rate reducing that um, acutely. Um, we, can, we often do it awake, um, but if there's a concern, we take them to theatre and we do it in theatre with the option to then 
surgically reduce that neck if possible, you know, if we can't do it closed. And that involves a longitudinal incision at the back, drilling off the facets at the back, and then reducing it down. So if I show you, I've got a little model here, sorry, this has got a, a disc replacement in. But if you've got the, the facets at the back, yeah. And if you've got them, I'm not sure, am I showing you a good view? I'm on my phone, so I can't see very well. So if they've jumped that facet and that facet is sitting there, what we then do, if we can't get that non-operatively or closed with traction reduction, we then have to surgically come down, sweep the muscle off the side, drill the top of this facet so that comes loose, and then this facet just slides back, and then it sits into the anatomical position. But then we're missing part of this top facet under there. And if we're missing this part of the facet, obviously this, the top facet can now freely move backwards and forwards. So we would then stabilize top and bottom and right. stabilize that together. Just on so, the side? So yeah, I mean, and this comes down to the personality of the injury. So if it's just the one facet, we want to minimize how many areas we, we stabilize. So um, I'm quite happy if the rest of the bone is good and there's no other levels affected. Um, just put one screw into that lateral mass, screw into the lateral mass below, and just a short little construct on the one side. Yeah. Some people would still stabilize both sides and that's a perfectly agreeable um, approach to do it. And it's just really a, a surgeon preference in terms of what they're happy to do. Um, if you've got a very unreliable person who's going to go out, ride their motorbike, do backflips, all kinds of things, you might opt for stabilizing both sides. Yeah. Um, if you've got a person who enjoys a quieter life and is a lot more concordant with instructions, you can most probably get away with, with just one side. So um, as much as you have the personality of the injury, you also have the personality of the patient in terms of you know, what they're going to agree to do and what, that, what instructions they're going to follow. All right. Okay. So, um, are there any sort of subtle red flags that you come across that, um, that are a, more of an alarm bell for you that, that we may not know of or, you know, have as much experience having not seen as much sort of trauma? Yeah. I guess particularly with chronic things, you know, like, I don't know, if you have someone with I had someone once that had chronic lower back pain that was from a large aortic aneurysm. So yeah. are there any other sort of clinical things like that that you think are important that we know? So yeah, um, aortic aneurysms are always ones to, to have in the back of your mind. Mm -hmm. That normally comes along with someone who's got back pain, who's having episodes of, you know, variable blood pressures, who's feeling a bit dizzy because once they reach the point that they're getting intermittent low blood pressure, they might be having blacking out periods, falling at home. So you always ask those questions, you know, how are you at home? Have you had any falls? Um, mm -hmm. If they say, yes, I've had a fall. Do you remember why you fell? Did you trip on something? If they say, look, I can't remember, I just blacked out. Um, you know, the standard question from that is, do you remember hitting the floor? Um, and then you can get a real sense of what's going on at that point. Um, if they're having a hypotensive episode where they collapse, and this is happening more frequently, then you are concerned, is that aortic aneurysm leaking? Mm -hmm. What you don't want to be doing is then poking that person's belly. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, we were all taught at school, I don't know if you guys, but, you know, you, you push down and you measured that size and, you know, you yep. could feel the pulsations and, you know, generally what you do is you put your hand in there and you just go like that and the person exsanguinates. So, oh. yeah. So what you don't want to do is you, you don't want to push on the belly. No. Um, you know, if you've got a calcified aorta, it, it doesn't always show up on the lateral lumbar spine, but certainly if you are looking at x-rays, always have a look for that um, as a cause of back pain. It's normally just one of the first things you tick off in terms of reassuring yourself. Sure. Um, but for me, the, the subtle red flags are subtle signs of stenosis and subtle signs of cord injury. Um, okay. And those tend to come out and manifest as some of the more subtle exam findings. So if you have someone with neck pain, particularly arm radiculopathy, um, 
I always go through those um, sort of myelomalacia type screening questions. So I always ask, what's your walking like? What's your balance like? Do you have to turn on the light to go to the toilets um, if you get up at night? And that's because if they are relying heavily on visual feedback for proprioception, because they've just lost that, you know, distal proprioception, they say, oh, yeah, no, if I don't turn on the light, I fall over stuff or my balance isn't very good. So that for me is a big red flag in terms of yeah. just doing that little bit more on the examination to see what's going on. Um, yeah. Always do Romberg's, always do a heel toe walk, um, because again, it's very, very telling about where you are. Um, then pathological reflexes, again, clonus. And the thing with clonus, a lot of people that see, and even here in the hospital, doctors do exactly the same, is that you'll do um, a, a foot clonus and you'll jack that foot up into dorsiflexion and you'll get nothing or you might get one beat. And, you know, up to two beats is considered normal. And they might do that twice and they move on to the other foot and they're, yep, yeah, we're good. And generally with clonus, um, unless it's very, very frank, where you get it immediately, it's a bit like that pull cord lawnmower that you just can't start. But then when you start, it then fires and it goes. So I always recommend doing clonus at least five or six times. Right. on that foot and you will be surprised how many times you then elicit a pathological clonus because um you know often you'll examine a person you say right this sounds like cervical stenosis and then you do the exam so but that's a relatively normal exam yeah. and then you're kind of like well, well what do i do now um yeah. but sometimes you've just not reached that threshold for demonstrating that clinical sign um yeah. so with a lot of the time you'll, you'll do it once you get like one beat or a bit of a flicker two three four five and then off they go and they're firing away mm. so it's always worth to do that a number of times yeah and the other thing is when you ask about fine motor movements person will say particularly if it's a bloke with his wife in the room no 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 i'm fine i'm fine and the wife is like yeah no he can't do this and he can't do that and be like no no i'm good i'm good yeah. um so it it's always subtle things so i always do those fine motor tests so, you know, this is a good one, the pinching one. So I start off slow, copy me, and then do the other side, copy me, and then alternate, and then getting faster and faster and faster and see that they can maintain their coordination. And the other one is foot tapping. So again, tapping the foot, tap the other foot, and then alternate, and then just keep going. And, you know, you'll end up with them tapping one foot and not realizing that they've missed the other one. And it's it's quite interesting to see that, particularly when they're not aware of that themselves. Yeah. Um, and then the other subtle reflexes are, I, I don't know if you're familiar with Hoffman's test. Yeah. So with, with Hoffman's, often you'll get a positive, if you do your brachioradialis reflex, your normal response for brachialis reflex should be an extension of the wrist. So that would be a normal response. The inverted one is when you test it and you actually get a, a, a slight flexion going down. And if you watch as you do it, you, you, you get a pinching sometimes of the thumb and the index finger. Yeah. So when you then come to do your Hoffman's, which is where you get the middle finger and you flick the middle finger, you then get a, a twitching of the thumb and the index. So you get them to relax their hand. Um, I can't do it on myself, but you stabilize the the, the yep. proximal phalangeal joints and you flick the distal one. So you're essentially doing, doing that and you, you're looking for that, that pinching sign. So that's, that's a really good one if you've got that. And then if they've got quite advanced stenosis, um, something that I always look for and I realize not everyone does is your deltoid reflex. So you come down from your acromion, two fingers into the middle of the deltoid, pop your finger there and then tap with your reflex hammer. And yeah. what you'll get there, you need to have the shirt off, but you'll see the latissimus dorsi will fire or the posterior fibers of the deltoid will fire. And you get a similar response with the scapular reflex, which is on the point of the scapula. Again, finger yeah. on there with the patella and you'll see that fire. So if you're starting to pick up those more subtle reflexes, the deltoid reflex and the scapular reflex, you know that you've actually got a fairly significant cervical stenosis and that is someone who should be seeing someone 
um, you know, in the hospital setting fairly, fairly promptly. Will you see some wasting in the, the small muscles as well? Would that sometimes or not? You do. Um, the issue is, is that, you know, at some point you've then got to delineate, is that a peripheral uh, neurological pathology or is it central? So mm. is that because of the stenosis or do they now have, you know, an ulnar nerve compression? Do they have a median nerve compression? Um, particularly if it's the intrinsics of the hand. Um, you know, so then you have to be very familiar with, you know, how do you distinguish uh, a, a cervical stenosis? from potentially an ulnar nerve entrapment at the elbow or an ulnar nerve in, entrapment in Guillaume's canal um, yeah. or a significant um, media nerve issue, yeah. Okay, okay, good. Um, okay, so in terms of lower limb um, tests, so you mentioned heel to toe is one that you always do. Um, yeah. Are there any other sort of tests that you use to distinguish, because I think for us, we see a lot of older people with questionable sort of cerebellar function. Um, yeah. and, and it's hard to know whether that's functional or whether it's, whether it's something more serious. Are there any other yeah. things that you do to delineate those types of things? So um, you can do it just sitting down with their eyes closed. And, you know, you can often see them sway forwards and backwards, if that's an issue. Again, cerebellar function comes into that. Um, the other one that's quite nice, but does need that stenosis to be fairly advanced before it declares itself is adductor escape. So you ask them to put their hands together and to squeeze the fingers together, but to close their eyes. Um, so you'd normally have the hand in the horizontal position. I'm just doing this so you can see that the finger position. So you've got the person positioned like this. Yeah. close their eyes, both hands together. And what you're looking for is an escape of the little finger oh. like that. And that normally comes on after about a minute to two minutes. So you do have to be patient yeah. um, and you have to encourage the person not to open their eyes. So you say to them, you know, show me a starfish, squeeze your fingers together nice and tightly, hold them there, close your eyes. And I'm going to keep you there for two minutes and just see how you do. And what will happen is that they'll start to relax and you'll see that finger start to drift right. like that. Um, and that's also a sign of cervical stenosis as well. And also when you're trying to um, you know, differentiate cerebellar signs to um, upper motor neural lesion signs, that's a nice one because it doesn't involve um, you know, balance, but actually gives you that you know, reflex pathway feedback. Wow, that's really good. I didn't know that. That's fantastic. Okay, so... Um, so how can we as chiropractors examine someone better to determine if they need an orthopedic referral? Like, I know we've covered quite a bit of it now, but are there certain things that you think, yes, you know, that's, that's an absolute um, referral that we need to stay away from? Um, and I, I guess an, an immediate referral versus someone who can wait a month or two months. Yeah, so um, I think we break those down into what we would classify as surgical emergencies yep. um, versus surgical opinions. So your surgical emergency is anyone, um, I would say, who has a rapidly progressive neurological deficit. Mm -hmm. So things like a foot drop um, need to be seen promptly because we literally have a two-week window in terms of where we can salvage that foot drop. Right. If the person comes to you and, and you discover that they've got a foot drop and you say, well, how long has that foot been like that? And they say to you, oh, this just happened yesterday. This is something that needs to come to ED and be seen ASAP. Um, not even necessarily through the GP because the GPs themselves don't necessarily understand the importance of this. This is someone I'd say, look, just go straight to ED right. um, and explain that you've got a floppy foot. Um, and that's because we would normally want to operate within a 14 day window to give that nerve every option or every chance of recovery. Yeah. If the person says to you, look, it's been like this for six weeks, eight weeks, you know, it's just gradually come on, then you, then there, there's no rush essentially because we, we've missed the window. Then you just want to support that foot, you know, a nice splint. You want to be sure that it is a neurological foot drop and not a tib anterior function. So you need to be very clear about what's a 
tenderness injury. So the other reason you get a foot drop is if you've got a tibialis anterior um, tendon disruption, which is quite common in the elderly, um, versus you know an L4 pathology, which would L4 L5 pathology, which would give you that foot drop. So you have to distinguish the two, and you have to be sure it's a neurological foot drop rather than a, a tenderness pathology. Okay. Um, the other surgical emergency is a cord requiner, um, which again, I think everyone who comes through the door, you should be routinely asking. And it's always interesting, how do you phrase this? Because not everyone's comfortable asking these yeah. questions. So I would normally ask, um, do you have trouble with your bowel and bladder? And the problem is, is that if you get an old duck um, who enjoys talking about bowel and bladder function, you might actually blow 30 minutes and not get any further forward. Right. So I normally say, I, I quantify that and I say, do you have any issues with your bowel and bladder? And by that, I mean, you know, do you have any trouble getting started? Do you feel that you empty your bladder fully? Can you stop with good control? So can you start and stop with good control? Do you feel that you empty your bladder fully? Um, and the other question is, can you feel your stream passing? Is what I normally ask. So if you think about the nature of cord recliner, it's normally a painless retention. And they go into retention because they can't, they've got no bladder sensation that their bladder is full. So they accumulate urine within the bladder till they reach the, you know, the total capacity of the bladder, which is somewhere between 800 and 1,200 mils. And then basically the volume of that urine overpowers the sphincter and they have this, this big flood of incontinence. So your, your urinary dysfunction for a cord requiner isn't because you lose control of the the ureter and the, the sphincter, you don't have a flaccid sphincter that the urine just pours out of. That's what a lot of people think it is. But it's actually that sphincter goes into um, sympathetic overload. So you end up with that contracture and they actually go into urinary retention, but it's painless. If someone's in urinary retention, but still is aware that their bladder is full, um, we often see them in ED and they're jumping around the place because they're in so much pain and then they need urgent catheterization. But someone with a cord requiner won't actually have that sensation. The bowels are different, and this is where you lose the anal tone. And often with this, you know, people say, look, I've soiled my underwear, I'm not aware of it, or I, I think I'm clean and I wipe myself and I still have bowel contents or fecal contents on the paper. Mm -hmm. So I normally say to me, you know, when you've wiped yourself a few times and you wipe again, does the paperwork come away clean? Are you aware that you're clean or you're unaware that you're dirty? So those are the discriminator questions for that. Okay. Anyone who's got any bowel or bladder issues, particularly acutely, um, needs to come to ED. So this is a little different because the person who bends over has a sudden exacerbation of back pain and then develops, you know, urinary and bowel dysfunction they need to come to ED as an emergency. Mm -hmm. The person who's got stenosis, who's just been gradually shutting down that function, it's been gradually declining, and then they kind of reach a, a tipping point, and then all of a sudden they lose that, there's less of an emergency there because the chances of reversal are somewhat less, you know, significantly less because they've had this chronic compression, you know, for years and years and years to reach that point. So. It is still a type of cord requiner compromise, but mm -hmm. that's different to a person blowing a disc and very suddenly compressing yeah. that, who goes from a very capacious canal to now a really shut down canal. And the other question that I normally ask with that acute cord requiner, particularly for men, is erectile dysfunction. Mm -hmm. So that's an important documentation as well. You know, do you still get erections? Do they feel normal? Um, and it's again, it's not a, a topic that people are comfortable discussing and people aren't comfortable asking. But I think if you just put it in a way that you say, look, you know, bowel and bladder, can you feel that the bladder's full? Can you start and stop with good control? Do you find that your under, underwear has become dirty that you're not aware of it? And when you wake up in the morning, do you get erections like you normally have or has that changed recently? Mm -hmm. um, is, is a fairly concise way of, of putting it where it shouldn't be too embarrassing for the practitioner and it shouldn't be too embarrassing for the person to answer. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it is something, as a chiropractor, you know, we, it, there has to be a lot of signs there for me to often ask that question. 
you know, yeah. some playhouse play house routinely. So, um, yeah, it is so important. And there are people that come in and say that's, you know, they, they've got that as a concern. So, yeah. um, I mean, it, it, it's always interesting to do that because, you know, some people are constipated, some people just have got really poor diets, some people have got prostate issues. You know, there, there's lots of reasons, yeah. you know, particularly women, multiple children. There's lots of reasons for them to have bowel and bladder dysfunction. But I think if they're coming to you in the context of having, um, you know, a back problem, particularly if they've got radicular pain going down the leg, particularly if it's a sudden onset, and, and that's all seen in context, I think that's a very, very important question. Yeah. Um, and it's something that for every single patient that comes to my door, be it a cervical issue or a low back issue, I always ask and I always document. It's just part of our routine um, questions. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I just think, you know, for me, it's like, it's, it's part of my spinal exam, part of my routine history, pretty much along the same lines as what makes it better, what makes it worse. So we've got a question here where someone said, what would you be looking for if a patient tells you they can't lift things past their waist and they're eliciting signs of intermittent portication from the lumbar spine? So, so Again, it comes down to history and examination. So you would go back to your history at that point and you'd be asking those lumbar stenosis questions. So straight away, you want to differentiate, are we talking about a vascular issue? So is it a vascular claudication? Is it a neurogenic claudication? If it's associated with lifting, you would think that it's more neurogenic than vascular. But I always ask the questions about, you know, what's your walking distance? what brings on the pain so does bending forward relieve the pain sitting upright bring on the pain standing for long periods bring on the pain and then my big discrimination between vascular and neurogenic is walking distance so when you walk and you then have to stop because the legs become painful or the back becomes painful do you just stand still give it a couple of minutes and then the pain goes away or do you physically have to sit down and bend forward and a lot of the time if it's vascular they say, look, I just need to stand still. I don't have to sit down. Yeah. And they'll time it. They'll say, look, it's exactly three minutes and I know yeah. I can walk again. Yeah. Um, if it's neurogenic, it's a bit more variable. They have to sit down. And then I always say, you know, particularly with blokes, this is great for blokes. Um, if the wife takes you shopping, how are you? Do you find that you have to use a trolley? And they'll be like, oh, yeah, no, I can be there for two hours. But if I've got that trolley to hold on to, I can walk through the whole shopping mall. Yeah. Um, and then ladies, it's to do with their groceries. So, you know, do you have one of those little pulley things? Do you use a basket or do you need one of the bigger trolleys that you can hold on to? Yeah. Um, and it, it's very much a textbook type question, but mm. it, it's amazing how many people give you that textbook answer. Yeah. Um, so if they can't lift anything above their waist, um, there's, there's two things there. So there's the mechanical issue of lifting um, and then there's the stenosis side of things. So you would have to really delineate, you know, are you dealing with the mechanical low back pain? And, you know, so do you have massive facet arthropathy that's contributing to a stenosis in terms of the degenerative changes? Or, you know, do you have a combination of a chronic disc bulge with facet arthropathy that's just shutting down that canal? Um, you know, so there's lots of combinations that you that you have to pick through, um, but you really have to chunk it down and then focus your history based on that. So if you are worried about a stenosis, I don't think you have to be that concerned about what the primary underlying cause is. So, you know, whether it's, you know, hypertrophied facets invading the canal or whether you've got a chronic broad based disc bulge, as long as you've identified its stenosis, you, you can then work on that person appropriately. Yeah. yeah. So um, in terms of um, after a discectomy, when, when would you feel it's okay for someone to be adjusted, if ever? And, and yeah, can, can we just talk about that a little bit in terms of you know, if someone had an L5S1 discectomy, when you know, when can we dress their sacroiliac joints to, you know, to help reduce some of the, the pain fibres from the lumbar spine and that sort of thing? Yeah, so my answer to that is immediately, um, okay. but it depends what you're wanting to do with the person. So 
if you're wanting to do a um, high velocity diversified side posture, I'd most probably say hold off on that for about eight weeks. And the reason for that is when we do a discectomy, we have to actually increase the size of the annular defect to fish out those fragments. So um, in terms of any rotatory type movement through there, there is a risk of actually extruding more of that disc mm -hmm. where you want it to settle down. So if we do a discectomy, we don't actually remove the whole disc. Um, which is something that we go through great pains to try and preserve as much of that disc as possible. We want to remove the disc bulge and any fragments causing that bulge and any loose fragments that may subsequently be extruded. But we don't then go in and clear out that whole disc because, you know, if the remainder of the disc is solid and well fixed, if you can get that annular tear and that annular defect to scar up, that will continue to provide good you know good function for a period of time it's not going to be a normal disc by any shape or means but it still has a function to provide so we do try and preserve as much of that as possible so any rotatory movements before eight weeks really runs the risk of extruding more disc fragments out and you know if anything was fixed you know potentially shearing through that area mm -hmm. and you know, giving us another fragment that we then have to go back in and retrieve. And the reason that's a concern is because we will do a, a discectomy, the original surgery, we will do a revision surgery, but the third time at that same level, if there's pathology in terms of more disc material extruded, they go on to a fusion. So what we don't want to do is we don't want to start fusing spines unless we absolutely have to. So I wouldn't say any rotary maneuver. If you wanted to position them on blocks, if you potentially wanted to do some gentle drops, if you wanted to do some hip movement, if you wanted to adjust the thoracic and cervical spine, all of that I think is entirely appropriate. Yeah. Um, what I wouldn't do is a, um, you know, any sort of forceful movement through that area for about eight weeks because you just want that scar tissue to settle down. And yeah. once that defect is scarred, you can go back to adjusting them. It's just that sort of, you know, initial post-operative period that you want to be quite gentle with that area. And someone's asked here, do certain areas recover better, whether it's cervical compared to thoracic or lumbar spine, in terms of their recoveries? I guess, from the, in this case, talking about surgeries and vascularity and that type of thing, is there any difference that you know of? Um, so, it, it's a bit of a big question because there's lots of ways that we do surgery. So, um, you know, we approach from the front, we approach from the back, um, yeah. certainly in the lumbar and thoracic spine, we approach from the side. Some of that involves taking down the diaphragm, taking out ribs. So, you know, it, it's kind of a question of how much is a piece of, how long is a piece of string. Um, the things that slow down healing tend to be things like poor diet and smoking in particular. So um, as a personal rule, I will not do a fusion procedure on someone who smokes. And, right. and that is a non-negotiable for me, unless it's an emergency. So unless they come in for a big accident with a fracture dislocation of the neck and I don't have a choice. If it's an elective procedure, if they are still smoking, even one cigarette a day, they will not get their surgery. So I actually do a urine test, it's called a cotinine test. And if they've had a cigarette within the previous 12 weeks, it will show up on that test, in which case I cancel their surgery. Well, it, it sounds terrible. It, it sounds terrible. And, um, you know, people are very upset with this, but I'm upfront with them about that. And the reason for that is if I show you, um, so this is a, a model involving one of the cages that we use um, in cervical spine surgery. So if someone has a anterior discectomy infusion, um, you approach through the front, um, yeah. You take the strap muscles medially, sternocleidomastoid goes laterally, and you come down onto the anterior cervical spine. Mm -hmm. You then clear up that disc, you clear out the disc bulge, you free up the exiting nerve roots, and then you put this cage, and you can see it's got a little hole in there for bone graft. Yeah. So that is where bone graft goes, and we either take that from the hip or we use an artificial substance. And then that cage goes in as a spacer between the two vertebrae. 
Now, you most probably won't see this on the, the screen, but there's a little blade. So if you look at the front there, there's, there's two little, um, I'm not sure you can see that, there's like a little post box, two yep. slots. And through that slot goes a, a curved blade. So one goes down and one goes up. And this is what anchors that cage into the actual vertebral body. So I'm not sure if you can see that there through the perspex, there's a little metal blade. Mm -hmm. So one on the top and one on the bottom. And That's this stops the cage. That's Sorry? The screws. I've seen somewhere that so screws you, down now. Yeah, so there, there's lots of different options. So there's some with screws. I, I like the one with blades. Okay. Um, and then you also get the one that is just the cage and then you put a plate on the front. Um, but again, whether it's a plate on the front, whether it's blades or screws, what you're trying to achieve is you just don't want this cage spitting out the front. Yeah. So these are just mechanisms of, of keeping that in place. And then this will fuse. So the vertebra above will fuse to the vertebra below and you'll have a fused segment. Um, so, you know, that is a, a very well tolerated procedure. People often go home the next day, if not the day after. It's, it's relatively pain free because we're not cutting lots of muscles. Yeah. Um, and it just needs time to settle and fuse, which is normally about three months, three to six months for that fusion process. Right. If, however, we go from the back, that is to a certain extent um, an easier procedure for me to do but it's a lot more traumatic for the patient because we have to strip the paraspinal muscles, the dissection is bigger. There's a lot of dead space where hematoma collects. There's a high risk of infection because of the skin um, and with the hair. Um, and also you sweat, you know, the back of your neck. And if that's something that we need to then put a collar on to support, again, it's hot, sweaty. People, some people have got really thin necks, lots of skin folds, um, hygiene's an issue. So, you know, in terms of cervical spine, you've got the, the nice healing one versus the absolute bastard. Um, yeah. And then you've got the lumbar spine as well. You know, we can approach through the front where we can do pretty much the same as the discectomy, but on the lumbar spine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, what we spoke about with the cervical spine, but going through the front of the spine. Um, but then you've got a person who's had sort of the equivalent of a C-section um, type cut on the front of their abdomen. It takes them a while for those core muscles to engage again. It takes them a while to get going versus a discectomy at the back, which is a smaller cut. We only disrupt one side of the muscle. We can get in and out with fair, you know, fairly little disturbance. So, you know, there's pros and cons for both. Mm -hmm. um, but people tolerate, you know, certainly anterior cervical spine stuff extremely well. But in terms of the healing, it, it takes slightly longer because it's generally a fusion procedure and fusion takes longer to settle than, say, a decompression where you're just wanting a bit of scar tissue to heal up the area. Mm. So we've got a question here where someone said, with, chronic, with chronic repeated disc episode, would you suggest, when do you suggest sort of referring for an opinion, like if they have more than two episodes in a year, even if some patients prefer a conservative approach, you know, when is it appropriate for you to say, look, this is something that seems to be, if they're getting sort of similar episodes, I guess, continually, yeah. what, at what stage do you think we should send for a neurological opinion and, and how, how do you address that? So a, a lot of this is a discussion between you and the patient. Um, yeah. And certainly when they get to hospital, this is the discussion that we have very frankly, because there's no such thing as you have to have an operation. Um, mm -hmm. You know, if it's a cord requiner issue and they've got frank, you know, neurological deficit, then that's a slightly different situation because, you know, that, that's a trying to preserve dignity kind of situation. Mm -hmm. If we've got someone who's just having pain, it depends on what they're prepared to do. So some people are just absolutely petrified of having an operation and would rather take painkillers and pursue non-operative management. Um, other people, you know, they tolerate pain for two days and then they've lost the will to live. So it, it really depends on the person's personality and it also depends on the pathology of the disc bulge. So if it's a very small disc bulge, you kind of then have to sit and think, well, what can I actually achieve with surgery? Because if I decompress that area, and there's, you know, nothing particularly dramatic there. Am I actually going to achieve anything given the risks of, you know, 
potentially a nerve root injury, potentially a dural tear, CSF leak, um, you know, wound infection. There's a lot of risks involved with these kind of surgeries. So you have to be sure that whatever you're looking to gain is going to be worth putting the person through all that risk. If they've got a big massive sequestrated segment or a big disc bulge and you say, oh yeah, that's you know, very obvious, I can see that, then that becomes a lot easier decision to make. Um, but then it's about what that person's happy to do, what risks they're prepared to take versus, versus not. So for example, I've got a guy with a very impressive disc pathology, takes up as probably about a third of a spinal canal, um, but he manages quite well with pain. Um, and I saw him about three months ago. He really wasn't keen on surgical intervention. He did some reading that said, you know, there is a chance that at 12 months, things could be a lot better. And he was happy to ride out for 12 months. So yeah. the, the referring on, I think, comes down to a number of things. It depends on, has the person reached the point where they feel what you're offering has reached its potential? And they just, you know, looking for something more because they're not coping or they need to work or, you know, whatever the situation is. Mm -hmm. Or have you reached the point that you are worried that this is progressing in terms of neurological deficits or changes that you now think, look, I think it's reasonable that you get another opinion. Mm -hmm. um, or does the person just want the reassurance that, you know, doing the non-operative thing is just taking a lot longer and they want to just have that discussion? So just because they come in doesn't necessarily mean that they need to have surgery or even that they want to have surgery. And we have quite a high percentage of people saying, thanks doc, I've seen the images. Yes, I know I've got a big disc bulge. I know you're a good doctor, but you know, I'm gonna see how I go, I'm happy with my chiropractor. Mm. So it's just, a, it's an open conversation. There's no such thing as has to have a surgery. Um, I generally say, look, that's a big disc bulge. I doubt that that's going to get better without some kind of surgical intervention, but I'm happy to give it a run for its money and we can see what it, what it does. And maybe in six months time, repeat that MRI. If it looks like it's reducing and getting smaller, then, you know, we can run with it a bit longer. If it doesn't look like things are changing and you're still having problems, we can talk again about what we, what we do. So, you know, there, there's lots of different conversations in there. So there's, I guess there's one more question here about um, some other things that we'll get to. But in, in terms of if someone does have signs of a disc bulge and, you know, we're seeing them, how, like, how long is a decent trial of care? Because if someone has surgery, they're going to take a couple of months to get over the, the surgery fully. Yeah. Given that, you know, there's no sort of signs of severe progression or any red flags, what should we be saying in terms of, look, you need to give this this amount of time for us to see if, yeah. you know, if we can make a difference? Yeah. So if I put that into context, if I show you the medical side of our timeline. Yep. Um, so, for example, someone comes into ED and is bent over. We do an MRI. They've got a big disc bulge and they can't cope because of the pain. So we admit them to hospital for pain management. They're normally with us for a couple of days. We work them up, we get them up with the physios, walking, engage their core, give them enough analgesia that they feel they can cope. Mm -hmm. um, we can do either a nerve root block or an epidural injection, which may sometimes just get them over the line. Um, as a pain management strategy, um, that, that's another whole conversation to have, but that is something that we often offer. Um, and then we will normally see them, if they've had an injection, we will see them six weeks after that injection to see how they're traveling. Mm -hmm. If they're still in a lot of pain, we will either do a second injection or we will see them again in about four to six weeks to see that things haven't settled. And if things haven't settled between the eight and the 12 week mark, and it's a substantial disc bulge, we generally have no problem offering surgery at that stage. But I wouldn't have someone come to ED with a big disc bulge bent over in pain. And unless they had cord requina or significant foot drop or anything like that, this is not something I would operate on before six weeks. Right. Um, and that's because you want to give it time to settle down. Yep. Um, you want that inflammation to settle and you want that person to be out of that anxiety state as well. So I think, you know, from a chiropractic point of view, anywhere between six and 12 weeks worth of care is a yeah. good run for its money in terms of 
conservative management. Um, even in private, if someone goes privately, where they can often operate a lot more quickly, um, they would generally wait between four to six weeks before doing any surgery. And that's just to give it a chance to see if it settles spontaneously. And if you get to six weeks and things haven't really settled significantly, then it's less likely to settle. So even in private world, they do tend to wait somewhere between the six and eight weeks before they offer surgery. Great. Um, okay. So I guess um, there's a couple of other questions. I, I think so. one thing that I wanted to try and cover is how can we build re relationships with medical specialists and, and would you recommend that we try and do that? Um, is that something that you'd recommend we do or, or not? Um, so I think this has to be a, a strategic approach from the, the chiropractor side. Um, and that's because, you know, even amongst the medical professions, there's, there should we say a certain cohort of our souls. Yep. Um, and I think that's the same with, with every profession is that there's got to be people who are more approachable. There's people who are more reasonable and there's people who no matter if you descended from the heavens with wings and a halo and everything else, they would still, you know, treat you poorly. And I think you have to find who those people who are more approachable are. And then those are the people who become your tribe. And those are the people you build relationships with because, um, you know, and even within departments, even within specialities, everyone knows there's certain people that are just, you know, it's like flogging a dead horse. You're just never going to win with them. Um, and I think, you know, if you try and do that from the outside, you're at even more of a disadvantage than, than what we are here. The other thing that you have to remember is that the medical specialities, particularly the surgical specialities, tend to be very aggressive um, in their training. So the whole way through from internship right up until you qualify as a consultant it's a very competitive very aggressive environment so if you approach someone and you think oh boy that that person was very brusque or very dismissive or you know that wasn't a behavior reserved for you because you're a chiropractor that's most probably just how they are yeah. um, and that's because how we interact with each other so for example in our morning trauma meetings if we have an observer in, they generally end up me feeling a bit traumatized because of the, the verbal, um, you know, arguments and battles and robust discussions about, you know, defending your opinion and why did you do that and whose stupid idea was it to do that? And, but, but that's just how it is. I think you've mentioned that before. So, I, that you would like that to be a little bit, for chiropractors to have a little bit more engagement like that in terms of backing our opinions and that type of thing. Like you were saying, it's, it's very... Well, I, I think, yeah, I mean, chiropractors are nice people. You know, you go to a conference and you get hugs and you get adjustments and people ask how your weekend was and people know you. Um, you go to an orthopedic conference, you are not going to get a hug. Um, yeah. You know, <laughs> you're, yeah. just, you're not going to get a hug. Um, people will be very collegiate, but, you know, there will be a lot of very, very robust discussions going on. Um, and certainly in the meetings, there's been a number of meetings where, you know, people have presented good projects and have been told to get off the stage. You know, right. someone's got up with a question and just absolutely floored them. And yet they'll be having a beer later in the bar. But it's kind of, you know, that that's just how it is. Right. So um, unfortunately, some chiropractors make the step forward, you know, to engage don't get an overly warm response. And because they're used to engaging with other chiropractors, get very put off by the fact that they feel that that, you know, that that was potentially a bit frosty and then kind of are discouraged from, from following that through. Whereas that frosty atmosphere is kind of how we work normally, you know, and, and in fact, you know, we work in quite an aggressive um, atmosphere. It's one of the reasons you know, women feel quite intimidated and there's a, there's a lot of that sort of boys club. If you kind of think of that rugby locker room yeah. in a way, that's, that's more about how we are rather than the ladies' tea party. Yeah. Um, so my advice would be is find out who's approachable, find out who's got a good reputation, who do you feel you could work with 
in a way. And you know, and the thing to remember is that a lot of these guys will be looking at chiropractors as a source of referrals. Yep. You know, and this is something that they're going to make money off of in their private practice. And trust me, they are not doing this for free, and they are not doing it at bargain basement prices. Yeah. So if you send them a referral and that referral then goes on to consultation, goes on to surgery, you know, and that referral was from you, that's a significant contribution to their monthly income. Absolutely. And, you know, I think as a chiropractor, you need to be aware that, you know, this should be an ongoing relationship. And if you're going to trust that person with your patients and trust that person with your referrals, then that person should at least have the manners to reciprocate and send that person back to you and not undermine your professional qualifications. And that goes, and I think I spoke to you, Nat, about this, about when you approach that person standing as a professional in your own right. Yes. Um, because I think many chiropractors stand in awe of these people who they think look are so better qualified and you know, so, so much higher up the, um, the professional ladder and they're not. You know, it's just you have different qualifications, but you should be standing on an equal ground in terms of you're a, you're an expert in your field, and mm. they're an expert in their field. And unfortunately, because of the competitive nature of where we are, um, you can smell blood real quick. Like someone comes in, and they are not meeting you on an energy level. It's something that you pick up, and it's something that these guys capitalize on. Not because they're being nasty. But that's just the environment we've grown up on. Yeah. So um, it's, you know, it, it's like they, they smell a bit of weakness and that will be something that immediately they will, they will move to a dominant position. Yeah. Um, and as I said, a lot of times it's not purposeful. It's just that's how we've been, been brought up and that's how things are played out in the hospital. So in terms of like we're getting some questions around, you know, how do we develop these communications and that type of thing so how do you suggest that we write letters first like to the specialists or you know call them up and ask for a meeting or what what would be the best approach um so i think different people are different um i think a little introductory letter to say hey you're a local chiropractor in the area um you've heard that he's got, you know, this person's got a particularly good reputation as a surgeon. Um, yep. And he's someone you would like to foster a professional relationship with in terms of, you know, potentially sending patients on for him who need a surgical opinion. And you would like to arrange a meeting to discuss this with them if this is something you'd be interested in. Yep. Um, and I think straight away, if it's reasonably short, you don't have to include a CV or anything, but just if you just get to the point real quickly, um, you know, in terms of you'd like to have a professional engagement. This is something that you'd like to establish a relationship with for the purposes of, of referral. Um, and then I think a face-to-face -face meeting is so much better yep. than, than written correspondence. Because again, once that person meets you as a person and sees who you are, it's a lot easier to then pick up the phone or refer someone because you've met them. Yep. You know, if you're still a stranger on, on the other side of the phone, like it's very hard bad to bad mouth someone you know. Yeah, that's right. Um, but if you don't know them and they're just a name, it's very, very easy to bad mouth them. And so when you are physically in their presence and you get to know them and you're at the point where you can phone them up or send them a text and say, hey, I've got someone I'm worried about, um, you know, is this someone you'd be happy to see? you know, then, then I think you, you then reach that level of, of having a meaningful professional engagement. So I would normally start with a bit of an introductory letter, nice, short and sweet. Um, I would state very clearly that, you know, you're looking to establish a professional relationship and that you would like to arrange a face-to-face -face meeting at a time of, you know, whatever's, whatever's convenient for them or, or you or who's ever the busier. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I was just thinking when you were saying that, that, um, when I approached our, our local surgeon, he, one of the things that he asked that I wasn't prepared for, I'd spoken to someone else who said, don't worry about that. They're not going to ask you, but he asked me what I do. And, um, and I was a little bit thrown <laughs> by, like yeah. I got there eventually, but, um, but to have a neurosurgeon sort of ask you, okay, you know, what is it that you do with people um, was, yeah, a bit of a moment there for me. So 
I think people need to be prepared for that as well, hopefully, if they're accommodating. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's quite important to be ready to explain what you do in straightforward terms that don't use too many controversial um, names. Yep. So for example, if we talk about a subluxation, I'm fully aware of a chiropractic subluxation is different to a radiological medical subluxation. Right. Now, they're not gonna be aware of that. So if you go there and say, look, I treat subluxations and I do you know, whatever, then chances are you're gonna have someone look at you going, oh, I'm not sure about this person. If you go there and say, look, I work with people with you know, a variety of musculoskeletal disorders, I like to focus particularly on, you know, neck or, you know, um, if you're talking about, you know, the neurological side of things, have a way of explaining what you do in terms of mainstream type terminology, because then they will understand what you're trying to say. Um, if you come along and talk straight away about vitalism, that's not something they're going to get. Mm -hmm. So this is something that, um, a lot of us work with, and if you speak to doctors, the concept of vitalism actually runs very strongly within the medical profession. They just don't call it that. Right. So if you start talking about innate, they're going to be like, what are you talking about? You know, mate, you're, you're off with the fairies. Yeah. But if you talk about, you know, the natural healing capacity of the body, if you talk about, you know, the natural progression of disease, if you talk about optimizing that process, if you talk about promoting you know that process within the body particularly from a neurological patterning side of things particularly yeah. from you know a musculoskeletal conditioning side of things these are all sort of soothing words to that grumpy sleeping bear and then yeah. he's like oh i've got a friend you know someone who talks my language um, and then as you get to develop that relationship you can start talking more about innate and, and these are concepts that we are fully aware of um, but we just don't label it like that. Yeah. Um, and, and we use that all the time. You know, the number of conversations we have saying, look, mate, just give it a bit of time. It's going to get better because this is what the body does. Yeah. Um, you know, everyone in medicine knows that. But when you say, oh, you know, we, we talk about innate and whatever, people are like, yeah, I've got no concept what innate is. So yeah. um, I, I do think there is a place for that, but you need to take that relationship in stages. So you first need to get your foot in the door you need to get yourself in front of that person in terms of that person being able to relate to you as another professional. You need to be able to sell what you do in terms that that person understands. Yeah. And then you have to have an ongoing relationship with that person. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So you would, I mean, it's a big letter writing thing in the medical profession. You would suggest that we just write a letter initially saying, you know, I'd like to have a phone call or like to meet you? Is that is that what the first step would be? Yeah, and, and what I would do with that is that I would make that maybe two or three paragraphs in yep. a letter, certainly not more than, than a page, yeah. um, less than a page, nicely spaced. And that's because um, surgeons in particular have got very, very short attention spans. We work with a high volume of patients and all our juniors know that they've got less than a minute to, to get our attention. So, you know, yep. for example, we're talking about a patient. Um, it's a 36 year old person who's come in with a 24 day, a 24 hour history of bowel and bladder dysfunction with an MRI proven large disc prolapse at L4, L5, and they've been starved for six hours. Can I book theatre? Yeah. Yeah. You know, that, that's how it goes. If they then start waffling about whatever, it's just like, uh, I'm not interested. Yeah. So keep it really, really succinct, you know, less than a page, nicely spaced, contact details, um, and then your qualifications on the yeah. bottom. Um, and I think it's important to make it clear that you're registered and that you've trained at a recognized facility. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's great. So I'm pretty much out of questions. Do you have anything else? that you think is, is kind of important at this stage? There's been a couple of questions about, you know, can chiropractors refer straight to specialists and that type of thing? We know that you can't do that, but you can do it through their GP. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, guess, I guess, yeah, in terms of 
um, building a relationship with GPs, is that a very different process than it is to specialists? I think it would be. It, yeah. it is, and the, the, the reason for that is the specialist is going to benefit financially from that referral. Yeah. So they have a vested interest in keeping that source of patients um, yeah. coming through, which is you. Yeah. Um, and particularly if you are, you know, known in that area, if there's not many other chiropractors, you are a very good, reliable source of income, potentially. So they are going to be a lot more open to meeting with you, particularly when they recognize that. Yep. The GP, on the other hand, you have to remember, has got very different qualifications. Mm. So the musculoskeletal side of their training is very, very small. So they don't quite have the, the depth of the understanding that you have. Mm. And they're not necessarily going to know the intricacies and they're not necessarily going to be familiar with some of the emergencies or some of the concerns that you might be having. Mm. So, so that, that is an issue there. Um, the other thing is that a lot of people with back problems and spine problems go to the GP repetitively and they have a huge number of people that they don't know what to do with. And they can't send everyone on to the hospital because we just don't have the capacity to see these people. Yeah. And another person coming back to the GP with back pain, the GP just sees that and it's a heart sink patient for them because they're just like, oh, what, what now? Yeah. You know, I've got another person, like another person's come back um, they very heavily audited in terms of the prescriptions that they write for things like opiates. Mm -hmm. um, so again, an, another person coming is just like, oh my goodness. Um, so I think if you send someone to the GP, if you've got a relationship with someone, you'd kind of want to sell yourself as you can help them with a lot of these heart yeah. sink type patients and potentially provide an avenue of care that is not the hospital that avoids some of those medications that will help them out. So their pain points are the having to write a lot of prescriptions for opiates that they then get audited and particularly penalized for. Yeah. And also the fact that these spine patients are long consults and often the GP doesn't have an answer for them. Yeah. Um, so if you focus on those two aspects and you say that to the GP, look, I can, I'm the person to help you out with this because I have some really good answers, then, then that's really good. And particularly if you've got a track record of, you know, what you do, the, the average number of persons um, or appointments that you have per person. If you look at, you know, um, if you've got a number of um, sort of observations in terms of, you know, within the first six weeks, I, can, I generally reduce someone's pain by about 50%. So again, as frustrating as it is, you are talking about pain, even though as chiropractors, you, you're not necessarily pain focused, but yep. that is what the GP is focused on. So remember, you are tailoring this discussion to the pain point of the GP. Yes. And then when the patient comes to your practice, that's when you can start educating them about the wider benefits of what you offer. But the GP is not necessarily going to be interested in that. The GP is interested in terms of how do they get the person out of their practice and how do they avoid prescribing opiate medications for them? Yeah, yeah. I, I think that's a really good point that, you know, they, you go into their offices and they'll have, you know, a rheumatologist name and they'll have a, you know, an allergy specialist name and that's just their answer for that problem. So you know, hopefully if we yeah. um, can answer for those particular problems, that'll you know, less people will end up having to go on opiates for long periods of time. Yeah. And the really good thing with the GP is, you know, if they advocate a, a pathway for a patient, if they've got evidence for that pathway, that makes their job a lot easier. So, you know, if you've got any favorite research studies that you like that, you know, show benefits for chiropractic care, particularly ones that compare various different um, health specialities, then yep. those are, are normally received very well. Um, yep. And that would be something that I might include with an introductory letter saying, you know, I'm the local chiropractor. This is my area of interest. Um, I hear, you know, I, I see that, you know, or I suspect that you're having a large number of people with these issues come see you. And I'd be really keen to discuss with you if there's a way we could provide a service um, to help you out in terms of, minimizing GP visits for this kind of problem. Yeah, right. That's great. 
So very different approaches from a GP to a, to a specialist. So that's fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And I think you have to bear in mind that, the, you know, you, you've got two very different professions, even though they're both doctors, what they're wanting to achieve out of that relationship is very different. And I think you have to have a different approach for both of them. That's great. So I, I don't have any more questions. I'm all out. So there's a couple of people with some other questions and that sort of thing. Um, but I think we've covered, you know, nearly everything. So, well, for this discussion, that's for sure. So, um, yeah, is there anything that you want to add before we sort of wrap it up? I, I just wanted to leave you with a thought because, um, Again, you know, we were talking about being a chiropractor, obviously being a little bit of a, a David and a David and Goliath situation. Yeah. And I, I just wanted to share something that someone had said to me that really resonated with me at the time and still resonates with me now, even though this was said to me a number of years ago, which is to stand as one, but come as 10,000. And that is when you are that person sitting in that GP room or talking to that specialist or writing that letter, you might be on your own, but bearing in mind, you have the backing of tens of thousands of people behind you supporting you with that. Mm. So um, even though you might be feeling quite lonely at that point in time and quite exposed, um, when you're standing there having that conversation, you are a specialist in your own right. Yeah. Don't feel cowed by the fact that you've got someone who's a specialist, but in a totally different field. You might not know a huge amount of what they do, but they also don't know a huge amount of what, what you do. So, you know, it's a stand as one or come as one, but stand as 10,000. Um, and that's been an ongoing motto of mine for a long time. That's great. Um, someone said, you know, how do we find out more about your resources and that type of thing? You've got, you've got a website, haven't you? Um, it's not one that I actively use. Um, yep. And I don't really spend that much time on social media because it's just, it's a time thing. It's, it's not yep. a, not wanting to engage. Um, but I'm more than happy, Matt, if, if anyone contacts you to either for someone to contact me by messenger um, yep. or by WhatsApp, um, I generally yep. answer, answer those. I might not get back to people straight away, but um, I do generally, <laughs> Matt knows he's had to wait a while for some of my answers. Look, I'm the, I think the thing is, I don't know how you manage everything you do. Like, you know, it, it's, I just go to work and go home. You've got all this, you're working crazy hours and, you know, doing incredibly complex surgeries. I don't know how you, how you manage it all, to be honest. So I'm surprised I get a reply, you know, within a day or two. It's, it's amazing. Yeah, but I'm, I am more than happy for people to contact me. Emails a little hit and miss because I get so many emails from work and then sometimes yep. it just gets lost in the volume. Um, but certainly um, Messenger or um, WhatsApp is quite good. Um, or if, you know, either contact you and then forward it on to yep. me if I've, you know, if I've not been. So if I've not replied, it's generally not that I don't want to reply. It's most probably just that I've, I've thought, yeah, I'll get back to that and it's got lost um, in the volume of things. Yeah, that's great. So thank you so much. It's been, um, I'm always so um, sort of in awe in terms of how willing you are to, to share your time with, with us. Um, and it is so valuable. Like I'm sure people have got a lot from, from this. So I know how I have. So um, thank you. Thank you so much. It's, it's really great. Yeah, no, I, I, I love talking to people. So if anyone's got any discussions that they would like or you know I often travel down to Brisbane um, sometimes I travel a little further afield for work and if someone uh, I'm always up for dinner and, and a discussion so if there's ever a small group of you you know if there's five or six of you that want to get together and we can meet somewhere for dinner and you want to chat and have a bit of a small group um, I'm always up for company and stuff I get quite lonely if I have to be somewhere else so um, yeah if, if I'm around if someone's there then more than happy to meet up with you guys that's so good Thanks a lot, Deb. So, um, nice. so we'll finish it up there, I think. And, um, and yeah, everyone have a, a good Saturday. And thanks again, Deb. Thanks, thanks very much. You take care. Bye. See you then. Bye.